for joining me for my presentation, which is going to be around uh, packaging trends in the FMCG market. And I'm going to focus on two specific areas um, that are high concern for consumers. One is sustainability in the environment, and the other is uh, the emerging concern around hygiene um, that is driven, obviously, by the, the, the emerging pandemic. So let's dry, dive straight in. Um, the data you're going to see um, today is uh, gathered by Mintel. Uh, I'm the Global Packing Director of Mintel, uh, and a lot of that is consumer data. And what we've done since the beginning of the pandemic is we've been uh, asking consumers questions uh, to track their concern and their feelings um, over time to see how their behaviour is responding, both in home and shopping, um, and their perception of, of packaging. Uh, and in addition to that, we have our Global New Products database, and you'll see some examples taken from that. So uh, the first thing to address is the fact that um, consumers do have a very high concern around um, uh, hygiene and safety, not just when it comes to food, as you might expect. I mean, here we see a large percentage of consumers uh, across Europe are, are saying that they are concerned about their food and drink being contaminated. And we've seen sort of news reports that would reinforce that, things like um, the uh, awareness of meatpacking factories in America or sandwich packaging uh, uh, facilities in the UK having uh, problems with, with COVID transmission. So we see that, but we're also seeing that coming through in beauty and personal care as well. So it's not something that we need to, we can consider to be focused on one area. It's something we need to consider across all categories, really. And the other thing to, to note is that, that whilst the science may not be um, uh, very strong in, in terms of uh, a, a very high risk from um, transmission from packaging, that doesn't mean the consumers don't have that concern. Uh, and we can see here very high concern um, from consumers around who might have touched the packaging before they pick it up in store. So whilst the science might, might be saying packaging is generally safe, that the UK ad advice, for example, from the government is that packaging is safe, um, we have to recognise that consumers still have this concern and therefore that's something we can still address and we can still give them confidence in the products um, that they're buying by providing the necessary cues that speak to um, the hygiene requirements that, that they need. So. Um, yes, we might sort of technically say we don't have a problem here, but the consumer thinks we do and therefore we need to still need to address that. So what is it that um, consumers are considering? Well, it's it's who's touched this, what's, what's uh, the uh, scenario that the packaging has been through before I get it. And the interesting to, thing to see is that consumers have various responses to that in terms of the actions that they take. So we hear see here, for example, that a significant number of consumers are leaving the, the pack um, once they've purchased it or once they've received it for a period of time to let the virus die off. This is something that was a strategy that was very much discussed around um, e-commerce at the beginning of the, of the, the uh, lockdown period for, for many countries where people were turning to e-commerce and, and a strategy was to, to leave it outside your front door or just inside your your front door for uh, a period of time, 24 hours or whatever, to, to let the virus die off. And some people we see, still see are adopting that kind of behaviour. Another thing we're seeing is, is wiping or cleaning the pack, so making sure that, that um, uh, the pack has been disinfected in some way. And again, this is really interesting because it starts to talk to us about uh, that's those structural cues that we can provide to enable consumers to do that. Do we have maybe folds that are difficult to clean under? Uh, have we got maybe textures and, and, and surfaces, things like matte finishes, which might have been great last year if we wanted to communicate natural and organic, but right now consumers want something that looks like they can clean it and they can, they can um, uh, disinfect. So those kind of structural cues are, are increasingly important. The other thing we have is very structural cues that um, address that touch point, that idea that there are elements of the packaging that uh, we touch in store, but there's also elements that we touch as a consumer that we have hyper concern around uh, when it comes to hygiene. And a really good example of a, uh, a very simple packaging format that addresses this, obviously it's a, it's a historical one, but speaks to that very well, is the, um, the San Pellegrino example of the peel off foil on the top of the can. And what this does is it adds a level of convenience for the consumer because it uh, tells them that the, the area that they, they are concerned around is protected, is going to maintained in a hygienic way until the moment of consumption so that they, they don't have to worry about it. 
The other interesting thing, obviously, is that this um, seal is branded. It's, it's another opportunity for the brand to talk to um, the, the consumer. So that's, um, that's, that's more opportunities there. The other thing to note is um, it doesn't sort of talk about COVID-19, it doesn't talk about the pandemic or hygiene, but it still manages to communicate hygiene. And I think that's a really interesting strategy because a lot of the times when we're consuming these kind of things, we don't want to be thinking about COVID and et cetera, but when we're shopping, it is something that's on our mind. So packaging structure that we recognize as maintaining high hygiene or maintaining a, a, a barrier, um, but at the same time doing that in a way that we don't talk about. So maybe tabs and peel off films and closures need to uh, have attention drawn to them through design, maybe bolder colors rather than through language that talks about COVID-19. We see other strategies, uh, another uh, good one, this one from China, this is uh, a, a snack uh, and the pouch has an embedded uh, wet wipe. Now this was actually developed for those consumers who want to eat the snack and then clean their fingers before they use their mobile phone. But that strategy of providing a convenience to the consumer to be able to wipe and clean and disinfect really speaks to, to that action that we saw consumers undertaking. And as we move forward in time and uh, uh, maybe return to uh, moving around and, and on-the-go consumption in a way that perhaps we're, we've moved away from at the moment, that kind of facilitating cleaning on the go is going to be important, not just in food, but also in beauty, and, and that will bring sort of uh, portability into household care as well. We see things like the airless packaging in beauty that, that is already really uh, prevalent, uh, now being talked about on pack in a way that takes it away from being about clean label and more to being about protection. So we're seeing a number of, of um, strategies using the packaging uh, to talk about the hygienic uh, protection of the product. Going forward, we might see the emergence of uh, antimicrobial films that are obviously traditionally used on the inside of the packaging to uh, provide preservation properties for the product, moving to the outside of the, the packaging to uh, talk about uh, maintaining the, the hygiene uh, or, uh, from those, those uh, unknown touches. Now, it's something that, that's emergent and we see a lot of talk about, but realistically, I've not seen any actual launches that take this through into the market. But it's an interesting strategy nonetheless. But that's kind of around um, what we think about when we're touching, when we're using the pack. But there's another really important element we have to consider um, in terms of changing behaviour uh, and the uh, impact of the pandemic, and that is the way we shop. Uh, here we see, for example, that a significant number of consumers are, are shopping online and we've seen a really big boost to uh, online uh, grocery uh, retailing, uh, particularly uh, amongst those uh, ranges of consumers and those demographics that perhaps wouldn't have done it before and wouldn't have been tempted to trial there. So the barriers to, to a move online shopping has really uh, decreased. But the other thing, and even stronger, is um, this, this reticence to, to spend time in stores shopping, to have dwell time in stores. So here, see here that half of consumers are, are reporting that they're spending less time in store. That might be because we don't want to be hanging around uh, other consumers who may be a source of, of uh, infection. The other thing is that there's a social pressure there. We know that, that um, sometimes there's queues forming outside of stores because you have to limit the number of people in there. So we don't want to squander the, the, the valuable time that we've been given and we don't want to, to force others to wait longer. So there's a social pressure. But whatever it is, it means that at, at the moment, uh, obviously we have even less time to um, communicate with the consumer than we have done previously. And up to the beginning of COVID, when we, we've seen a, a proliferation and explosion of uh, product claims um, around sort of ethics, around quality, around all these sorts of things, um, packaging has had become sort of quite shouty, quite um, noisy. And that's really not going to work in, a, in an environment where either we're shopping online, so we see a thumbnail, or we're, we're rushing through the shop, uh, trying to get things done as quickly as possible. So we need to consider our packaging design and how relevant it is for that kind of shop uh, environment. And here's a really good example of a, a re packaging refresh that has addressed that in-store recognition. This was actually launched again before, before COVID, but speaks to this trend really well. This is a brew dog, and we see their old pack design. It's quite funky, it's eye-catching, it speaks to a lot of the qualities that the brand wants to get across. But we've got layered text on top of each other, which makes it difficult to read. It's at 90 degrees. Obviously, that's not the way we, we naturally read uh, things. So trying to identify, one, the brand, and secondly, the variant you want, uh, takes a bit of time. 
whereas the, the refresh, the, the brand is now much easier to identify being a very bold center, uh, centrally positioned name. The text is, is put in an in a orientation that you can easily read and then bold, striking use of colors and text to identify those product variants. And I think that's this is just simply around identification, but that idea of obviously if we have a USP, we need to communicate it. Maybe we need to reduce the number of claims on front of the pack so that the, the ones that we know uh, consumers are purchasing around are the ones that we focus on uh, and we simplify in order to make best use of the time in store. The other thing that we're seeing is that consumers are turning to the products that they buy in order to enhance their, their immune system as a sort of protective measure. Uh, and we're seeing that consumers are either eating more uh, nutrient rich foods or actually turning to foods that make claims around uh, being able to support your immune system. And as a result, we're seeing products coming through that, uh, that support that. And it might be things as simple as this example from the US uh, where um, it's a brand that's the, uh, a variant of the, the range that they now call immunity. So I mean, basic uh, way of, of tagging to that. But there are other ways that uh, brands have responded. The example in the middle um, is a uh, health-based uh, confectionery. And what they've done there, put a sticker on that very quickly alerts you to an, a vitamin that is related to uh, immunity. So it's, it, what they've done is recognizing that, that obviously creating a whole new uh, printing line for uh, their flexible packaging is at an expense um, that they aren't willing to go through or is not going to be in the timescale that they need to get their message out. A simple sticker has, has brought that uh, uh, immunity message front and and forward. And we're also seeing interesting sort of strategies in things like beauty and personal care. Um, this is a skincare product that uses probiotic claims. So a claim that's very um, focused around immunity in food being borrowed and leveraged to make that um, uh, connection to immunity in, in beauty and personal care. We also have to consider um, that behavior that we saw at the beginning of lockdowns in terms of shelf outages. And um, there's a number of, of uh, things that have come out of this. Uh, one is obviously uh, a, a concern and a willingness to stock up from consumers. But the other thing we're, interesting that we've seen is this has driven a real big concern about food waste. I think that if you're concerned about getting hold of food, then you see much more value in the food that you have in your cupboard. So we're seeing a really big rise in food waste concerns and therefore packaging that can uh, provide uh, either things like portion packs, which preserve uh, the, the, uh, the rest of the pack until you're ready to, to consume it. Things like that are going to resonate quite well at the moment. And linked to that is, is we're seeing this um, reappraisal of uh, sort of packaging formats that deliver a long shelf life. We're seeing consumers returning to tinned food. We're seeing consumers uh, saying they want more premium products or a greater range of products in, in some of the, the pack formats that we see in centre of the store. And this, uh, whilst at the same time was, we're seeing consumers spend less time in store, their footfall has changed from maybe going around the edge of the store to the deli, to uh, the bakery, to those fresh uh, areas. They're also visiting, revisiting the center of the store, those longer shelf life areas that, that were perhaps uh, in decline before COVID. And there's an opportunity here for us to re-premiumize some of these pack types and to challenge uh, conceptions around uh, nutritional quality of some of these. Uh, I, I want to move on to, um, in the remaining time we've got, look at uh, sustainability. Now we know that um, it was really, really big before um, COVID in terms of a really strong consumer push uh, against particularly plastic as a result of concerns around ocean plastic. We have seen some uh, element of mitigation from consumers. We see consumers saying that, that actually right now, um, maintaining hygiene is more important than reducing plastic. So in the case where plastic does offer that hygiene benefit, then I'm prepared to, to essentially give it a bit, of, bit more of a free pass. But people are still looking for responsible uh, packaging and people are only saying plastic has a free pass where it does deliver on those hygiene benefits. This isn't to say that consumers all of a sudden think that plastic is an okay material. So we need to, to recognize that. And the other thing is that, that I think consumers are, 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 if anything, going to be even more concerned around sustainable packaging and the impact of packaging on the planet. When we consider this narrative is emerging that the pandemic itself is a result of our broken relationship with nature and therefore that link between doing good for the planet is going to 
uh, become one that if I do good for the planet, I'm doing good for my health as well. And I think that's going to reinforce uh, consumers' uh, actions around sustainability and sustainable packaging. And the other thing is we've not seen uh, microplastics and plastic pollution um, exit the news. Here, for example, um, uh, the uh, middle of May, when we're at the height of lockdown, we saw uh, news reports around um, ocean plastic and the fact that it may be a far bigger problem that, than we expected. So this is something that consumers are still exposed to as a, as a concern and therefore still thinking about. And if anything, this is, is, this is developing now to something that's not just around the ocean, but we're seeing the effect of microplastics on soil biome. Um, and this starts to really bring it to home because whilst we might want the ocean to be nice and clean and, and healthy, um, if the soil that our, the crops that we eat are grow it, grown in is damaged, then that could have a big impact on our own health. And therefore um, it brings it from something that may be far away to something that's right outside our door. And therefore, again, it's going to re reinforce and perhaps reinvigorate the anti-plastic um, trend. Because we, because of um, obviously a big, strong focus on the ocean initially, we've seen we saw a, a, a big drive to include ocean plastics in household. We saw some uh, initially some of the smaller brands take that up, and uh, that's sort of merged into bigger brands. When we've now seen ocean plastic actually coming through to food as well, so uh, these kind of small-scale interventions um, are starting to expand. Uh, and this is actually a private label example, so it's uh, it's moving beyond simply brand into private label as well. So we're seeing some novel um, material source claims coming through into, into food. But realistically, if we look at the, the kind of sustainable packaging uh, claims on pack that we're seeing across Europe, um, and this is a, a confusing chart, but the obvious thing to take away is there's one big bold orange bar that is high across the lot, and that is a recyclable packaging. Other things like uh, compostability, biodegradability, things like low plastic, um, those are all pretty negligible, really, in terms of the, the number of claims being made out there. The claim that actually resonates with consumers and the claim that they have, have access to and see and is actionable in terms of the consumer being able to do something about that packaging at end of life is recyclable. And we see that growing and dominating claims. The second slightly um, larger bar there, the gray bar is um, FSC certified board. And obviously across Europe, a lot of board and paper and liquid cartons obviously are FSC certified. So we see that as a significant environmental claim around packaging as well. But that's not really growing. Um, that's just being maintained. That's something that, that I don't think consumers are particularly focusing on at the moment. And we know that, like I said, recycling really sort of feeds into what consumers are doing, the behaviours that they have. So consumers are actively recycling. Uh, they're looking to brands to make packaging recycling. So it's something that's become not, not uh, something that brands can use to, to claim that they're, they're uh, doing the right thing environmentally. It's now a hygiene factor. It's something consumers expect. But interestingly, what, what we're now seeing really emerging and quite strongly is consumers starting to question where is all this material going? And just as they uh, do with many other sort of sustainability issues, they're pushing this back, back on the brand and saying, well, why are you not using recyclable materials or recycled materials, sorry, in, in your packs when you make them in the first place? And so we are seeing a growth in that kind of uh, packaging format, making uh, recycled content claims. And what's really interesting for me is we're starting to see some that recognize that this is an emerging area and sometimes consumers need not just uh, help to understand um, what this is about, but also um, some text that, that contextualizes uh, the use of recycled material and links it to the activity that, that uh, the consumer has. And this is a really nice example here of uh, packaging that talks about the recycled material in terms of it's as the equivalent of um, a, a, PET, uh, a PET water bottle. And so what that does is not only is it puts it in context so that the consumer can understand the amount of recycled material there, but it links it to that consumer's act actions. We, I mean, PET bottles are one of the easiest uh, pack types or, or one of the most common ones that uh, are recycled uh, across, across the world. So consumers are very familiar with it. They're likely to have done it. And this validates that kind of, of action that the consumer has undertaken. But the other thing we're seeing now is actually quite advanced uh, sort of communications around not just that it's a recycled material or that it's post-consumer waste, but taking it to a level that, that relates it to consumer actions or to uh, another action. Here, for example, we've got, I'm just going to 
look at a couple of these. The middle one is from Japan and on the back of the pack, it says this is made from material that um, you have brought back to your local store for recycling. The, the, uh, another one from the Netherlands there where it's made from uh, plastic recycled in the Netherlands. So it's just making that more relevant to that local consumer. What we're also seeing is, and going forward, I think this is where we're going to see the emergence of a new trend in, um, in uh, the um, sustainable packaging, and that's around carbon. We're seeing consumers, a large number of consumers, recognizing the impact of climate change. We've got the, the, the horrible uh, wildfires that we saw in, in Australia and America really focusing attention. And as such, we're seeing a real growth in um, carbon claims on pack as, as uh, brands recognize that consumers are looking to um, brands to, to respond. And we see some quite bold things like Brewdog again, now um, claiming to be carbon negative. And I think uh, shortly after they announced this, uh, Google um, also announced that they were gonna go the same way. But I think what's really interesting is how we can link some of that emerging concern around carbon to existing concerns. So this is a really um, interesting example where the use of recycled plastic um, is being linked to a lowering of carbon footprint. So it's taking existing sustainability uh, actions, but then um, explaining them in terms of the carbon impact. The other thing that, that we need to be aware of is that not all packs are created equal when it comes to carbon. And whilst this might benefit some, it could also damage other pack types. And here, here for example, we see a plastic pouch uh, that makes a claim that by being a lightweight plastic pouch, it has a lower carbon footprint than a, an equivalent metal can. And so that's a potential threat to some, some heavier, more energy intensive pack types to maybe look at the, the routes that they take in order to have a re reduced carbon story that, uh, that can resonate with consumers. So just to, to summarize, I mean, hygiene, obviously really important, but it's structure and it's visible structure that consumers are looking for. When it comes to, uh, to plastic, people are not necessarily now looking for elimination of plastic because there's a realization that it's everywhere, but people are looking for responsible plastic. So only use it where you have to and where you're using it, make it recyclable and increasingly include recycled content. But going forward, the thing that consumers are going to increasingly be looking for is an explanation of carbon so that they can measure and see their own impact of their own carbon footprint. So thanks for that. I think we've got some time for some questions. Uh, so pass back to Josh. Benjamin, thank you so much. Um, I, I, have, I have a lot of questions and I noted down a lot of questions. And every time I noted one down, you then answered it so <laughs> it was it was it was a very complete uh, presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. And I think you know you're you're sort of creating creating that framework of okay, we have hygiene, we have sustainability, and then moving into carbon. I think is very much in line with what what we what we are seeing on on the event I run here in in Paris, which is related to the beauty and. Uh, perfume market in particular and, and other areas of the luxury market. So yeah, I, I, I recognize a lot of what you're talking about in, in the world, in the world that we're seeing. Thinking about hygiene, are there, are there particular areas that, that you see being impacted? Um, and, and what I have in mind is, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned at the moment about food service packaging. Um, and you know, my, my ability to buy something, something from a shop and eat it or drink it or, or, or whatever. I, I, but, but clearly there are, there are, there are other areas. What, do you want to maybe dig a little bit deeper? Yeah, I, that and, I can, I can address that. I mean, the th yeah, the thing that we've seen in terms of concern around hygiene at the moment are quite general, uh, but I think you're right that those will become a little bit more sort of targeted as our behavior changes and as we start to return to doing some of the things that we did before. So you're right that that on the go kind of moment that that consuming direct from the, the shop that the impulse kind of things that, that we buy, those are the ones that will have a greater a requirement for sort of hygiene um, deliver, delivery. At the moment, what we're seeing is an increase in at home consumption of the things that you would normally consume on the go. So consumers are saying well, I'm snacking more in the home than I did 
uh, previously because essentially I'm replacing the snack I might have had on my commute to one I'm having at home. Or what I'm doing is I'm treating myself in the evening to something that relaxes me because I, I wanted to, to de-stress. So we're not seeing a really a decline in consumption of, of some of the things you might consider a little bit more on the go, uh, but um, we're seeing a change in, in usage. And so the way we deliver on that at the moment might be, okay, consumers are, when they're shopping less often, they're shopping a multi-pack. So that's quite easy from a hygiene perspective. You take the multi-pack packaging off the outside if you're really concerned, dispose of it straight away, um, you've got that. But going forward, you're right, we're gonna to move to that on the, on the go, buying single units, particularly if I'm going into a store and I'm buying it and consuming it right then. That's where the, the, the concern is going to be. The other thing we've got to consider is the way consumers use things sort of in the home. Are they things, things that, I mean, we've got a lot of uh, store cupboard staples that people are buying that they might be putting in their cupboard, leaving for a while, those are gonna be low concern. So it's uh, the slightly fresher things that they're going to be consuming more quickly. So that's again, a, maybe a slightly more um, focus on chilled items that will be uh, where consumers have that, that greater concern. So, so it's going to be sort of across the board and even, I mean, who knows what the future, and I don't have a, a crystal ball, but I, I think that concerns around hygiene are going to be with us for some time because they, they are becoming innate, they're becoming ingrained, and that level of, of concern is not going to drop away any anytime soon. Um, and indeed, I mean, we've been tracking concern throughout the whole period and it, it doesn't show any sign of, of uh, being assuaged. Yeah, okay. And, that, and uh, it related to that, I was going, I was going to ask as a, as a follow-up, how do you see how do you see this conflict between um, sustainability challenges on one hand and hygiene challenges on the other? You know, what what do you think the end game is on that? And we've we've probably been talking about end games in packaging for ten years and never got to yeah. one. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's a it's go? the thing is that we've been we've been struggling to to find packaging that is both sustainable and delivers on consumers' needs the whole time that I've been working in packaging as you. As you hinted at earlier, I've been around a long time, um, so it's not it's nothing new, and we still haven't got there in terms of you know we 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 have a packaging environment uh, that that doesn't impact on the natural environment. So I think this is just yet another challenge that that we need to face. But the the benefit is that we have consumers who are on on our side. They want to. To, to do the right thing. And as I said before, when it comes to, to plastic, for example, as a, as a material, they're, they're, they're seeing that and they're saying, yes, I, I'm uh, less concerned about it as a, as a negative, but at the same time, I'm still wanting it used responsibly. So um, I think we just simply have to add it to that list of things that need to be ticked alongside sustainability, because we still need resealability. We still need convenience. We still need to communicate uh, flavor and all the, and the branded benefits because without those, I mean, there is no market. Without many of those, we would get massive food waste. And obviously we, we increase um, sustainable actions, that, uh, inactions that way. So there's, there's, there, there, I think it's simply something we have to absorb. We have to recognize and we have to make it part of our sustainably, sustainable innovation funnel because if any packaging innovation funnel out there isn't a sustainable one, then you need to completely reappraise what you're doing in the market because that's the only type that consumers will accept going forward. Yeah, it doesn't get any easier, does it? When you're when you're in no, but that makes it fun. <laughs> well, exactly. It's, it, exactly. It keeps us keeps keeps us all on our on our toes. Benjamin, thank you so much. We we have to leave it there, but but thank you so much, Benjamin.